Okay, it's getting dark and you've got that gut feeling as if someone's after you. The first thing you might want to do is to start walking slightly faster. This trick can help you either get rid of the suspicious person behind you or confirm your worst fear. Now it's official. There's somebody dogging you. Your heart rate is insane. The heart pumps your blood as never before. Try to make turns. Three or four right turns are enough to bring you back to your starting position. This trick will do two things. First, you'll have a chance to disappear, especially if you know the neighborhood well. Second, you'll once again confirm this person is after you. Try to take those turns wisely. The moment you make one, start running to make the follower lose sight of you. Don't do that if you've never been to this area. The odds aren't in your favor. You're more likely to get lost, or worse, get trapped in a dead end. You might get lucky and meet someone you know in the street, like your beefy neighbor with that Rottweiler you're kind of afraid of. If there are some people walking by, even if you've never seen them before, just say loudly, hey there! Basically pretend you're friends. Tell them someone is following you and ask them if they can walk with you to a more public area until you find another way to get home. A big no is to enter your condo when you've been followed, even if a group of people are offering to help. Sounds creepy, but your street follower will probably remember where you live and might want to come back later. But let's consider you're not lucky. The street is deserted, there's only you and that creepy person behind. Make sure your clothes won't let you down. If you're wearing a hoodie, tuck the hood down the back of your jacket to hide it. If your hair is up in a ponytail or bun, let it down as you walk. It'll be harder for your follower to grab your entire set of hair or pull your clothes if they have nothing to hold on to. Your clothes and shoes can actually help you escape if you were caught by a stranger. You can try to squeeze out of a jacket. Hopefully, you've got the front zip kind. High-heeled shoes seem to have been designed for self-protection, certainly not for walking. One of the most effective techniques to save yourself when you're being attacked is the foot stomp. Stamp with all your strength you've got on the top of your stalker's foot. Sounds rough, but it will definitely draw their attention to more urgent stuff. Flat shoes will work too, but they're obviously less effective. You gotta shake that stranger off. If you aren't far away from the busy road you just left, you can pretend you've forgotten something. Pat your pockets, act like you're looking for something. Say out loud, shoot, where's my wallet? Don't go, look for the phone, the stranger's gonna think you don't have it, which makes it easier to catch you. Also, never say that you've lost your keys. They'll come in handy later. Now, start walking even faster in the opposite direction. Your stalker will be less likely to pursue someone who's running towards a busy road. Bonus! They were probably after your wallet, not you. They aren't really that likely to dog someone who doesn't have money. Don't take your phone out and start browsing or texting. The light from the screen will make it harder for your eyes to adjust in the dark, and looking through your phone will slow you down. Plus, it might be the phone the stranger wanted to have, so don't let them know where you keep it. It's great if you're in the area you know well. If not, try to remember as many details as possible. As you walk, find out the street name, look at the house numbers, and what shops or buildings are around. If you carry heavy books and grocery bags, be prepared to drop them as soon as you feel something's off. Holding on to heavy items will slow you down. Don't stay quiet. Make a fuss as you try to leave and scream fire instead of help. People will rush to help someone who calls fire to prevent their houses from being burned down. Okay, one more scenario. 10 p.m., you're off to the gym and waiting for your bus to finally show up. Remember a couple of simple rules. First off, Try to stand near other people who are also waiting. If it turns out there are no people, stand inside an occupied building in a lighted area – at least there are people inside – until your transport arrives. When the bus is finally there, be aware of people around you. In case someone seems suspicious to you, or they're acting weird, make sure to let the driver know. When it's late in the evening, the buses are usually almost empty. Don't go to the furthest corner of the bus take the seat closest to the driver. If you go out of the bus and feel like some other passenger who left at the same stop is following you, go to the nearest place to ask for assistance. It might be some occupied building. Another possible scenario is someone following you in public. 
If that happens, try to get to a supermarket or a coffee shop and lose yourself in the crowd. If your jacket is a different color from your shirt, then remove it. It'll be harder for your stalker to identify you. If you walk into a restaurant or a coffee shop and your follower is determined, they'll walk in and wait for you. One thing to do is go straight to the bathroom and stay there for 5 to 10 minutes. They might get tired and leave. If you get out and they're still there, get in the line, order a drink, and casually let one of the staff members know that you're being followed. They must do something and keep an eye out for you. Get your drink and sit down. Go on your phone and let your family or friends know where you are so they can come and pick you up or keep you company. While you wait, try these tricks. Yawn. If the person watching you yawns too, it means they've been watching you. Yawning is visually contagious. (laughs) Then pretend you're looking at your watch. If they check their watch too then, they've got their eyes on you. To trick them, get your stuff. Get out of the coffee shop for 2-3 to three minutes and walk a little bit down the street until they lose sight of you. Then, as soon as they come back out, walk back into the coffee shop. They'll have no reason to walk back in unless they were following you. When someone comes to pick you up, ask the staff to guide you to the back exit of the coffee shop just to be on the safe side. Try not to walk alone at any time. Always get the busy roads and be aware of your surroundings. Okay, let's say you've reached your condo with no trouble. The elevators are a usual spot for shady characters. Remember, you should always check out what's inside before you enter one. If there's someone next to you acting suspicious and they send shivers down your spine, just wait for the next elevator. When you're inside, try to stand next to the control panel. Even the nicest person may accidentally start accosting you. If you feel like the situation is getting out of control, You've got the panel, so you can tap the button and ask for help. Not only people, but also dogs can follow you. Of course, dogs are people's best friends, but sometimes even they can pose a serious threat. Joggers, runners, and bikers may trigger the dog by their motion. First, always avoid direct eye contact. You need to stand a bit sideways to be a narrower target for the dog. Still, keep the animal in your peripheral sight. You can also distract the dog's attention with something. It's probably a good idea to always have something on you for that. It can be a sweatshirt tied around your waist. You can pull it off quickly and throw it to distract the dog's attention. If you go jogging and you know there might be stray dogs, take a stuffed doggy toy with you. In case of emergency, even throwing a shoe can be a nice idea. But walking home barefoot doesn't sound like a nice experience. If the worst is inevitable, Make sure to protect your face, throat, and chest. To protect your fingers, keep your hands in fists. It may sound strange, but the best place to be bitten is the forearm. If the dog bites you, don't pull away so you don't make it worse. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane, and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day. The sun is shining and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human, or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp, dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, 
you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing and you stay inside your hut where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm and you catch some Z's on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky. You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. 
you put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, the sun begins to set, and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you, but then someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you. It's safe to say that duct tape has truly saved your life. Well, you finally made it! After all that training, you're ready for your first skydive. Full of confidence, you reach the door of the plane as it gets to 12,000 feet. You step off into the air, but at the last second, you hear the instructor screaming something. Sorry, I didn't check your shoes. Well, you can't hear him as you drop away from the plane, seeing only his concerned expression. Well, feels like something has gone wrong. You pull the handle to release the parachute, but it hasn't deployed correctly, opening into a big wad, and you're now spinning faster and faster. You're getting dizzy, but you need to pull yourself together. Each second is crucial, and from this altitude, you have less than a minute to act. You throw yourself into the Bowman Formation, spreading your body out with your arms and legs forming a big X. This creates a little more drag, allowing you to stabilize a bit. Hey, this whole thing is a drag. Now you have more time to get to your emergency reserve chute. Still dizzy from spinning, you try to remember where it is. You grab what you think is the right strap and pull it hard. Oh no, that's a leg strap! You've loosened the container on your back, and now you're slipping out! This is not your lucky day. You hold on and tighten up the leg strap. Oh yeah, the safety procedure is coming back to you now. Hmm, step one, cut away from the main parachute with the red handle. Done! Now you're in free fall again. Step two, now find the silver ripcord handle to pop the reserve chute. Gotta hurry, the ground is rushing up at you. Where's that handle? Whoops, there it is. Sitting on your chest on the left. You yank it hard. Cut thump The chute flies out and deploys and slams the brake on your descent. Now you're relieved. Breathtaking? Heart pounding? Oh yeah! Finally, you can enjoy the view. For about 10 seconds before you land on the ground. Softly. Feet first. Hey, looks like fun. Sign me up. On another day, as always, instead of taking the stairs, you use the elevator. Now, the odds of it falling are 1 in 10 million. You're 10 times more likely to be hit by lightning. But today, you're in that unlucky elevator. As you move down from the fifth floor, the pulley system fails, a cable snaps, and the elevator starts falling. Quickly, you lie down on your back, placing one arm around your head to protect it from the impact, and the other arm over your face to save it from possible falling objects. You spread your legs out evenly. In just a couple of seconds, you brace for impact. It crashes down, and debris from above falls around you. Fantastic job! You've avoided injury! But could it be possible to alter the impact by jumping? Well, let's think this through. If you jump too early, your impact would be more severe as your speed would increase in the descent. And if you jump too late, the velocity of your jump upwards would cause you to bump your head as the elevator would have stopped. You need to jump at the precise moment to be effective in velocity. And without the ability to see through steel, it would be down to sheer luck. So it's better to use the lie-down method. Yeah, good luck with that. 
you casually drive to work, passing over the same bridge as any other day. Today, there's more traffic than normal, and you're stuck in a jam. The bridge starts to creak. Unfortunately, it's possible for structurally faulty bridges to collapse under excess weight. And there you are. As the bridge falls into the river, your car floats on top. The water is slowly rising around you as it starts to sink. You're trying to remain calm and take a deep breath. You have up to two minutes before the car completely sinks. You need to act fast and roll down the window. As you take off your seatbelt, you notice the water has risen above the windows. You try to roll them down, but they're stuck in place from the pressure. You've missed your opportunity. You're sinking further down and thinking about opening the door. Hmm, better not. This will make your vehicle sink even faster. Plus, it'll be more dangerous to exit. The car hits bottom, and the water is slowly entering it. You try to open the door, but the pressure is so intense that it won't budge. You think about the water coming in. Maybe if you waited until there's enough water inside, it could regulate the pressure, allowing the doors to open. But with the limited air that would remain, and if the doors still don't work, that's too much of a risk. Your only choice is to smash the window. You can do it easily due to the water pressure, and it spills in quickly. You take your last deep breath while holding onto the window frame. The car fills in quickly, and the suction suddenly stops. You pull yourself through the window and place your feet on the car, push upwards, and swim to the surface. Yeah, remind me not to carpool with you. Next, you're out hiking in a forest and find the perfect place to view the sunset. You take a photo, and it looks great. But wait, which way is it back to camp? It's getting dark, and you have no idea how you got here. You check your phone. It has a map, so you'll be fine, right? Well, you've taken way too many nature pics, and the battery has run out. You can survive up to three hours without shelter in harsh weather. You can go without water for three days, and up to three weeks without food. You need to address your next actions in order of importance. So your first task is to build a shelter. You lean a large stick onto a tree for the roof support. Then you build two walls on the sides, making a sturdy frame. There are plenty of leaves in the forest, and you cover the roof with heaps of them for insulation and protection. On the inside, you build a nice leafy mattress. You enter and wait until morning, hoping to have a relaxing sleep. Well, you've slept horribly, but there's no time to leave a review on your booking app. The next task is finding water. You follow a clear decline in the land, eventually finding a stream. Clean water? Check. You continue to walk with the stream's flow, hoping it leads you to a river. You are more likely to find people and signs of civilization along large collections of water. Hours pass, and your belly grumbles. You look around for tasty snacks. There are berries and mushrooms, but you don't recognize them. So it's better not to eat something if you're unsure whether it's poisonous. You search under old logs and branches for bugs. You've found some mealworms that can be eaten raw. Some insects, when cooked, can be a major source of iron, protein, and vitamin B12. You look at them, and your appetite goes away. Hmm, maybe later. Finally, the stream connects to a river, and just ahead of that, a bridge. Not the one that fell down. Well, the struggle is over. You throw the bugs away and begin the next adventure, finding a diner. Yeah, we're not going camping together either. Next, you're walking in a field. The wind is picking up, and not far away, a tornado is forming. You start running away from it, but you can't outrun it as it travels up to 60 miles per hour. Your main concern isn't the tornado itself, but the trees and buildings that the twister takes in, turning them into dangerous flying objects. They fly at crazy speeds as they're carried by fast winds, reaching up to 300 miles per hour. You look for shelter, but there's nothing available. Your only possibility is a ditch that's not surrounded by trees or other breakable objects. You lie wedged in a ditch and cover your head with your jacket, holding it down with your arms for protection. While lying flat, with that thundering noise around you, you feel like you're in a giant jet engine. It's a terrifying sound. But luckily, you're not in the tornado's pathway. You can hear the small debris whistling over your head, and many make an impact, thudding all around you. But thankfully, they miss. Suddenly, everything goes calm. You lie there controlling your breathing, trying to relax. You don't get up, not yet, as the worst may be yet to come. Tornadoes can last from several seconds to up to an hour. 
you're not taking your chances and remain in your ditch for the full hour. But finally, when it's clear that it's gone, you dust off your jacket and head home. Meanwhile, you're really bad luck, so I'm removing you from my contacts and unfriending you on social media. And I'll do that once I get out of the hospital. Okay, you're falling off a cliff. You somehow didn't know about her boyfriend. Dang, you're in a tight spot. Time to break the way down into several parts. Try grabbing anything you see as you plummet. Shrubs, trees, or rocks. This way, you divide a long fall into several short ones. With each new fall, the impact will decrease. If enough of the impact is absorbed, it means you've got a better chance of survival and another chance at love, but not with her. Same for if you drop out a window. Try to cling to anything on your way. It probably won't hold you, but at least you'll have several falling intervals to help decrease your speed. A canopy to stop you can be a real lifesaver, no matter if it's plastic or glass. It'll hurt either way, but you'll survive maybe. You also need to bend your knees a little. If bent, your legs will touch the ground simultaneously, and the consequences will be less severe. Another tip is that whenever you land, try to do so on the tips of your toes and never on straight and locked legs. Don't forget to cover your head with your arms. They will help protect your noggin, no matter if you land on concrete or in a puddle of mud. Now, quicksand is not as dangerous as shown in movies. If you get stuck in quicksand, dang, you're in a tight spot. First off, stay calm. Then, you're not likely to sink more than up to your waist. Toss away anything that makes you heavier. Shoes, bags, even clothing. Wiggle your legs to create room for water. It'll help you get away. Your arms should always be up. Try floating, but not on your stomach. Move backward with small steps. Big steps are harder to take, so it'll take longer to get out. When you reach solid surface, roll out of that quicksand. Surviving a wild animal attack may be challenging, but a crowd of people is not any less dangerous. The crowd may move like a fluid, not letting you escape. If you're trapped between hundreds of people, dang, you're in a tight spot. Rule number one is not to stop. Stopping is the fastest way to fall. If you actually do fall, make an air pocket. Your arms should be placed above your face and chest, embracing them. If you manage to stay upright, as soon as you feel the surge coming, move with it and sideways at the same time. If you're lost in the wilderness and need to go fishing, you can use a can tab. Shape it in the form of a hook. Cut it at a slant and trim off the metal to make it look like an actual hook. The main thing is to create a sharp point. A can can also become a makeshift cooker. Take a can and cut out a hole from the side. Put some kindling inside and set it on fire. You can fry an egg on top of it. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wilderness. First, use it as a fishing line together with a can tab hook. It can also serve as a clothesline stretched between two trees. It's thin, yet a single strand can hold up to 5 pounds. You can make a spear by binding a long stick and a knife together with dental floss. It's also quite flammable, so if you don't have any kindling to set larger pieces of wood on fire, try burning it. Dental floss can also be great makeshift shoelaces. A simple plastic bottle can make a very strong rope if you have a good knife. First, you need to find a small stump. It should have a diameter about the same as your bottle. Make a slit across the middle of the stump. Then cut a notch out of the stump large enough for your knife blade to fit inside. Cut off the bottleneck and make a small notch on its edge. Its width depends on the rope width you want. Place the edge of the bottle inside the center slit and put the knife in the notch in the stump with the blade towards the slit. Start slowly dragging the bottle through the slit. You'll see the bottle spin. As it spins, the blade will cut out the rope. You can use it to build a hut because it can secure logs really well. Now, a human can go several days without food, but there's no way we can survive without water. Water in the wild can be delicious sometimes, but if you feel like it's not safe to drink, you may need a makeshift water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling water may not be enough, so as soon as the fire ashes are cold, grind them to a powdery consistency. 
Don't use charcoal you randomly found in the forest. You never know what's in there. Then you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and make a hole in the cap. Turn it upside down, put in some charcoal, 3 inches are enough, and pour the water over it. The dripping water is ready to drink. To catch any excess charcoal, wrap the cap with a piece of clean cloth for extra filtration. Okay, you're getting hungry, and you probably need to start a fire. Dang, you just don't have any matches or a lighter. Empty your pockets to see if you can make a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery, probably the one from your flashlight, and a gum wrapper, that's enough. You need to cut a thin strip of the foil wrapper, yet long enough to connect the two ends of the battery. The middle of the strip should be slimmer than the ends. Get closer to the pile of dry grass, small logs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip will ignite in seconds, setting the kindling on fire. Mosquitoes are a real pain, and there are loads of them in the woods. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those bad guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit that's full of essential oils. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin, crumpling it a bit beforehand to make those precious essential oils come out. One more useful way of keeping mosquitoes at bay is to add a few orange peels to your tinder. While burning, the essential oils will release and frighten those pesky guys away. If you want to send a signal that you're lost and it's an emergency, cover three small fires with any green vegetation, like grass and then cover it again with some wet fabric. You'll have big, white smoke puffs. Three puffs in a row means emergency. Adding some oil to your fire will turn the smoke black. If you don't have oil, use birch bark instead. Remember, the higher you start the fire, the better. So climb to a visible area. If someone has your hands tied together, dang, you're in a tight spot. The first thing to do is move your wrists to loosen that tie. Ropes can usually be cut through with friction against hard and sharp objects. If you're tied up with a zip tie, try to break it. Clench your fists, press the knuckles together, raise your hands above your head, and then bring them down sharply. The pressure will snap the tie. You may also try to slip out of the zip-tied knot. First, clench your fists. The wrists will go larger, like this, widening the bonds. When you relax your hands, the bonds loosen, so you may slip out. Duct tape can be chewed through, or if you moisten it, it will turn softer and easy to loosen. You can even moisten it with your saliva. Crossing a water current may be more dangerous than it seems. When crossing, choose a straight and wide section. Before stepping into the water, check if the current's not too fast. Throw a stick in it, and if it moves faster than your average walking pace, Consider crossing at a different location. Or you could just look around for a boat that's nearby. No need to be silly about it. Welcome back to Science and You. As you're walking in the wild, a snake appears from some dry bushes and bites you above your ankle. How rather unfortunate. Keep calm. You must keep your heart rate and blood pressure low to slow down the spread of the venom. Remove your shoes and socks. Now you must find out whether the bite came from a venomous or non-venomous snake. If you see two deep puncture wounds on your leg, they came from the venomous fellow's fangs. In a non-venomous serpent's bite, you'll see small sharp teeth in a U-shape. There are around 600 venomous snake species, and you should look out for vipers and cobras. Each has a different type of venom and needs different treatments. If a viper bites you, don't put pressure on your wound. Trapping the venom in one area could make the tissue damage worse. Then you must rush to the nearest hospital for treatment. If a cobra bites someone, you must tie the area with a bandage to stop the venom from going further into their system. Keep an eye on the fellow that was bitten to make sure they're breathing. Yes, cobra venom can paralyze the diaphragm. Don't suck out the venom. It travels so fast into someone's system, you'll achieve nothing. Take a good look at the snake, and if you can, snap a few photos of it to show the medical staff. Try to have good picture composition. Moving on from snakes to allergies. 
Most people respond to allergens with a runny nose or some sneezing, but others have far more complicated responses. An itchy rash may be a sign of an allergic reaction. It might look like dermatitis, and it can show up a week after your exposure to an allergen. There was a rare case a few years ago. Someone got braces for the first time, and after a week, they developed an itchy rash under their wristwatch and stomach. As it turned out, they were allergic to the nickel in braces. If you get blisters on your skin after sitting in the sun for one to two hours, it's probably not sunburn, but an allergic reaction. You may also have some skin redness, tiny raised bumps, and scaling. When that happens, go to the emergency room fast. Experts will run tests and give you advice on how to continue from there. Sometimes different medications might cause it too, or fruits such as limes and parsnips can. If you're allergic to pollen, stay away from fruits and veggies. Some of them have proteins like the ones found in pollen, and your immune system responds to it as real pollen. They can trigger the same allergy symptoms such as itchiness, swelling of the mouth, face, and, well, you know the gist. You're trapped in a car during a winter storm. Outside it's freezing, and you begin to shiver. That's a good thing. When temperatures drop below a comfortable level, your body starts to shake. This action boosts your body's surface heat production by 500%. But shivering can only warm you up for so long. After a while, your muscles will run out of fuel and they'll stop contracting. If someone suddenly stops shaking and they grow tired and want to fall asleep, act fast. Bring them indoors, remove any wet clothes, rub their hands and feet, wrap them in blankets, and find warm, dry compresses to apply to their chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never put a warm compress on their arms or legs. The sudden heat will force cold blood back to the heart, brains, and lungs, causing the body's core temperature to drop. While you're driving down an empty road, you hear an emergency radio broadcast about the weather. A tornado watch in your area means that a tornado is likely to happen. But a tornado warning means a tornado has appeared on the radar or has been spotted in person. You should also be on the lookout for hail. It appears when updrafts within a thunderstorm push the rain into the thick clouds and it freezes. But when a tornado is approaching, hail can arrive without rain. Then everything gets quiet. The air becomes still and there's no wind. Suddenly, you'll see the clouds moving quickly in a rotating pattern or toward the sky. You'll hear a loud waterfall sound that will turn into a roar as the tornado gets close. It'll be similar to the sound of trains and jets. Debris will begin to fall, and a funnel-shaped cloud will start to rotate, pulling branches and leaves upwards. If the tornado is not moving to either the left or the right, it might be coming toward you, and you won't realize it until it's too close. Take shelter! Just as you're chilling at home watching TV, you hear an eerie whooshing noise. It sounds like a soft gush of wind, but you confirm there's nothing there after checking all the doors. The next day, you feel pressure in your chest, and it gets worse as the week progresses. The chest pains follow with a dreaded feeling of exhaustion. You can't help but think there's something wrong with your body. But the problems are within your house. You might have carbon monoxide poisoning. When this gas fills your home, it builds up in your bloodstream and it replaces the oxygen in your body. Poisoning can also cause headaches, nausea, and confusion. In those cases, run outside to get fresh air and call emergency service. Also, get a carbon monoxide detector and add it in the hallway or areas where you sleep. Check the batteries twice a year, and when the alarm goes off, step outside and you know who to call. You go ice skating. The ice on the lake seems thicker than it was, and uh-oh, you hear a cracking snap, and you end up in the icy water. 
First, your body will go into shock because of the sudden change in temperature. Don't worry, it will pass after one to three minutes. Now, you must find a solid piece of ice and hold on to it. Don't try to climb it. Just put your arms on it, kick your legs, and push the piece forward. It will help you drag your body onto the ice. Once you're on an ice sheet, don't stand up. If you do, your body weight will concentrate on the smaller ice area and it'll break again. Just keep rolling until you're further on the stable ground. What if you have to break the window of a hot car? Car windows have layers of materials that can resist force. Here's what you need to do. Avoid the back windows or the front windshield of the car. They're harder to break. Go for the passenger and driver's side windows. If you've got a hammer, don't hit the glass in the middle. Aim for the edges, where the glass breaks easily. Now, if the windows refuse to break with a hammer, screwdriver, or whatever you've got around, look for a small, pointy rock. If that doesn't work either, then your best bet is your car's spark plug. Pop your hood, pull out the spark plug, break the porcelain casing, and throw the broken ceramic piece anywhere at the window. It's the middle of summer, and you're vacationing somewhere on the Pacific Rim. Suddenly, you feel a strong quake. Well, this could be the first warning sign of an approaching tsunami. Or it could trigger large waves thousands of miles across. But there are other telltale signs that a tsunami is approaching. One is a change in water levels, either rising or falling. If you see the ocean withdrawing quickly and the seabed getting exposed, you should run at least 100 feet above sea level and one mile inland. Many experts say once the seawater starts receding, you've got five minutes to evacuate before the enormous wave hits. Remember, it's all about science and you. Whoosh! Wah! You've just been pushed out of an airplane up high in the skies of Brazil. And there's nothing but you, your parachute, and the ground far below you. And it's getting closer by the second. Open, open! Oh, you useless backpack! Phew, finally. But you notice, you're now gliding straight. Oh no, you're falling down into the Amazon River. There's nowhere to escape now. Splash! You're in the water, covered by the heavy canvas. You push it aside, struggling for breath and trying to find your bearings. But as soon as you free yourself from the parachute trap, you notice some strange movements underwater. There's one dark silhouette circling around you. Hey, there's one more. Two, three, five. There's a whole school of fish, and they seem to be a little too interested in you. Oh no, you freeze in horror. Piranhas. All you want to do is scream in fear and get away. But wait, piranhas are calm and even a bit shy. They usually won't go after humans. In fact, it's like with most animals. They're afraid of you more than you are afraid of them. Plus, they're more of scavengers than hunters. So they're not really that into you. But if you make any sudden moves, they might panic and want to come and check out what's going on. With their teeth, of course. Some piranha species are even vegetarian. Don't get your hopes up too high, though. These surrounding you probably wouldn't say no to some nice human steak. So yeah, either stay calm or try to move really slowly. Red-bellied piranhas, the most dangerous species among them all, have very good hearing and react to noise. That's how they locate their prey. The entire school communicates by sending signals to each other when they find potential prey. Try not to become it by yelling. Red-bellied piranhas not only hunt when they hear noise, but they also produce it themselves. If you pick one up, or if it faces another fish, the piranha barks like a dog. <laughs> like they aren't scary enough already. Don't throw away your parachute just yet. If there's anything in your backpack, try to protect your hands and feet. 
These are vulnerable, easily accessible, and probably quite tasty targets piranhas might go for. Their jaw is strong enough to crush bone, so some solid shoes and thick gloves will come in handy. Movies often present piranhas as ferocious monsters with a huge set of saws for teeth. No wonder we're all afraid of them after seeing them ruin all the lake fun during the spring break. Hollywood actually picked it up from Theodore Roosevelt. At the beginning of the 20th century, he wrote a book where he described piranhas as the most ferocious fish in the world. He said he saw a school of these fish deal with an entire cow in a matter of seconds. Well, it might not be entirely like that. Research showed this is not quite a typical situation when humans or some bigger animals face piranhas. Yes, their razor teeth are really insanely sharp and around one quarter of an inch long. It's common that marine animals such as sharks and piranhas often lose their teeth. Sharks lose them one by one, while piranhas replace them in quarters. Piranhas have a strong bite, and the reason why they can actually take down animals many times their size is that they don't waste any time chewing. As they snap their jaws and bite down, the food simply goes into their bellies. They rotate, change position all the time, bite their prey, and take turns incredibly fast. So, if you see that boiling water effect going on, it spells trouble. Mega piranha, the ancient relative of today's fish, lived around 10 million years ago and had an insanely strong bite. T. rex's bite, for example, was only three times stronger, despite being way bigger than mega piranha, which only weighed around 22 pounds. We're not part of their everyday diet. Piranhas are more likely to go after animal remains or some sick old animal that can't even move properly. Hopefully, you're not close to their eggs because they won't hesitate to use their teeth to protect them. That and the situation when they're literally starving. Those are some moments where their attack can be a little bit extreme, like with that cow from Roosevelt's story. Still, research says dealing with a bigger animal like that within five minutes requires around 500 piranhas, which is definitely a lot more than any recorded wild school. In fact, the common shoal size is often around 20, so they'll need a bit more to take you down. Slow moving, shallow, and warm water is something they prefer to chill and breed. So if you have the chance, try moving to deeper, colder water with stronger and faster currents. Okay, so you manage to escape piranhas. You're swimming, the river is taking you far away, and oh no, a fin is heading your way. As if the Amazon River is not scary enough already, now it needs to have sharks too. And it's not just any shark. We're talking about the bull shark, one of the most dangerous species related to tiger and white sharks. Plus, it even has the strongest bite of them all. Piranha who? These guys are in way more movies than them. Bull sharks can be found in both salt water and fresh water and they simply love warm, shallow river-type waters. Yes, like where you are at the moment. They don't rear their young or lay eggs. Similar to mammals, their pups are born live, which is why they prefer to go for freshwater habitat. They eat turtles, birds, crustaceans, and other fish. Those that live in Africa sometimes even attack hippos. They're not often lucky with those beasts, though. They're really not that picky when it comes to food, so I doubt they'll refuse a tasty bite swimming towards them. Even though the only thing you want is to catapult yourself as far as possible at that moment, try to stay calm. Maybe a shark is just chilling because it already ate too much, so it's passing you by without any interest sparkling in its eyes. Move slowly, float, and keep an eye on the shark. Wait for it to swim away from you. Oh no, maybe the first one doesn't feel like going after you, but the second one came a little bit too close. Okay, different rules then. These animals prefer easy meals that will swim into their mouths, so they will certainly appreciate if you don't defend yourself, which is exactly what you should do. 
go for sensitive body parts, such as eyes, gills, and nose, especially if you have some sharp objects. When in shallow water, take a defensive position and stand firmly on the ground. Show off a little bit with all those moves you used to watch in martial arts movies. If there are reefs, rocks, or some other firm objects around you, back up against them so the shark can't surprise you from the back. If you're in open water, it would be better to have a companion to take a back-to-back -back position so you can cover all directions. Boom! You got it in the eye! Startled, the shark is leaving. But don't relax just yet. It will probably return after its eye goes back to normal. Now it's time to let out all your panic and swim away as fast as you can to finally leave water and all those creatures lurking under the surface. You get out to the shore, breathing heavily, and try to relax. Hopefully, it's over now. Haven't you gone through enough? Oh no, another noise! What is it now? To make any matches waterproof, cover them with a thin layer of transparent nail polish and let them dry well. To always have something to light them with, glue a piece of fine sandpaper to a lid of a plastic box and put matches inside. Cotton clothing won't keep you safe and warm out in the wild. It takes forever to dry from sweat or rain, and wet clothes lose heat 25 times faster than dry ones. If you don't want to freeze, go for polyester, nylon, or wool. Take microfiber towels that dry in an hour. If you're lost in a forested area, try to find a spot with dark or damp soil. It's likely there's water under it, and you can make a seep well for fresh drinking water there. Dig a hole about twice as wide as your arm from elbow to fingertip and half as deep. Use small rocks to line the side and the bottom to keep the dirt from your fresh water source. You can use your t-shirt or a bandana as a water filter. Put one end of it in a container filled with dirty water standing above an empty container for clean water. The other end goes in there, and the water pours in cleansing itself on the way. Be sure to boil the filtered water before you drink it. Another use for your t-shirt is a dew collector. Wipe it over some grass covered with dew early in the morning, then squeeze it into a container and you'll have safe drinking water. You can also leave it in a rainstorm to collect some water. A clean shirt or fabric works best. To survive a waterfall plunge, take a deep breath as you are getting close to the edge. Reposition your body to go down feet first. Wrap your arms around your head and seal your nose from water with your elbows. Tense your muscles, put your legs together, and close your mouth and eyes as tight as you can. When you get to the bottom, start swimming away from the waterfall while you're still underwater. Now, if you ever fall into rapids, hold onto a boulder, a log, or whatever comes handy so that the water doesn't carry you deeper. Throw off any heavy gear and start swimming downstream in the direction of the shore. Don't stand up and walk even if the water seems shallow, because the currents can carry you back. To come out of a storm dry and warm, you can make yourself a waterproof trash bag mini shelter. Just make a hole for your face and put it on. Use two bags to keep your feet dry, too. You can also build an A-frame shelter out of a trash bag. Find some cordage for the central rib. Split the bag into a blanket and cover the rib with it. Use four rocks to keep the corners down. If you hear thunder outside, count the seconds between it and the lightning flash. If it's less than 30 seconds, you've got to hide somewhere because the storm is too close. If you can't do that, at least stay away from tall, lone trees. If you're in a group, spread out to minimize the risks of everyone getting struck. To help your campfire keep you warm for longer, put some rocks around it. They'll keep the heat and spread it even when the fire is gone. You can also boil water with them if you drop a hot rock in a metal container with water. To escape quicksand, shift your weight to your right leg and shake your left foot to get it up to the surface. Get your left knee on top of the sand and shake your right foot to get it out into a kneeling position as well. When you're on solid ground again, carefully roll as far away from the quicksand as you can. If you find yourself trapped inside a cave, you have to stay calm and not use matches to light up your way. It can take some priceless oxygen from you. Protect yourself from breathing in dust with a t-shirt or whatever you're wearing. 
just wrap it around your head. Make a whistle out of an acorn cap to call for help. Hold the cap with both hands between your thumb and index finger. Make a V with your thumbs near the top of the acorn. Hold it close to your mouth and let some air in that triangle in the cap. You gotta practice a bit to make a loud sound. To stay warm in the wild, use grass or leaves. Get them under your clothes or blankets for an extra layer of insulation. This tip works both for winter and summertime. You always risk losing more body heat than you can produce. To set a tree on fire even when it isn't dry, use the Swedish fire log technique. Set the log vertically, make a star-shaped incision as deep as possible. Put some splinters and dry grass inside the log and set it on fire. It should start burning quickly and last from 2 to 5 hours, no matter what size or type of wood you use. As you prepare to spend a night in the wild, find a big rock that can fit your sock or pillowcase. Put it close to your campfire to absorb some heat, but don't let it get burning hot. Turn it around so that it warms up on each side. Once it's ready, carefully wrap it in your cloth with two layers for better insulation and put it into your sleeping bag. In case you go kayaking and your vessel flips upside down, don't try to turn it over from underwater. Instead, get yourself out of it and swim deeper down and away from the kayak, and only then get out of the water. If you're nearsighted and lose your glasses or contacts in the wild, curl your index finger into a tiny hole and look through it. A pinhole works like a natural lens that lets the light through in one place and keeps things in focus. In case you're lost in the wild and want to escape as soon as possible, stop your attempts for the night. Hungry, nocturnal animals will just love to meet you out there. Plus, there can be insects and snakes on the ground that you'll never spot in the dark. If you don't have a sleeping bag, you better sleep above the ground. Don't climb on trees, you might easily fall from it at night. Instead, take any large piece of fabric, make knots on both ends, then tie a rope on each side and secure it between two trees. If you don't have a rope on you, why not? Nah, you can make one yourself out of plants. Just find some long grass, better dry one, and weave it together in a braid or just a cord. After a rendezvous with bugs and mosquitoes, put some toothpaste on the affected areas on your skin. Menthol will cool down those spots and reduce all the unpleasant sensations. A banana peel, some ice, or aloe vera will also work. To relieve a bad headache without a pill, chew on willow bark. It works just like aspirin. It shouldn't have any side effects unless you're allergic to aspirin or take too much of it. If you get lost, remember the rule of three to stay calm and do the right things in the right order. You can survive three minutes without air, three hours in extreme temperature, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So start with building shelter, then get water, and only then take care of food. You can clear your car windows of mist with a raw potato. Rub a half of it on the inside of your windshield to spread the starch evenly across the glass. When it dries up, it'll stay on the glass, and it won't get misty again. You can see clearly now, the rain, I mean, the fog is gone. When you think of the world's most dangerous bird, as I do sometimes, eagles or vultures may come to your mind. Surprisingly, these awkward cassowaries may cause way more damage than the other more notorious angry birds I first mentioned. The largest cassowary species may be as tall as an average person and weighing as much. These plump birds can't fly, but neither can you. Plus, they run fast, so don't you try to escape from them. They can reach you even in water since they're great swimmers. They can run as fast as 30 miles per hour, so you might need a getaway car if there's a cassowary who's mad at you. But don't worry, their attacks are quite rare anyways. Mute swans are gorgeous, graceful creatures. At least that's what we all think. But touching one of these 28-pound birds is a bad idea. They have bony spurs in their wings that they use to take enemies out. Their wingspan is about 8 feet, and they can slap you with all of that. And they also bite. Don't ever get too close to one. They regularly go after humans, especially if the bird has younglings nearby. 
And don't let the name fool you either, they aren't mute. Swans can hiss loudly and even bark. Good warning signs that you're encroaching a bit too close. Humans and magpies have always had weird, almost love-hate relationships. These medium-sized birdies can be pretty aggressive at times, but if you treat them well, you'll probably become friends. They can recognize human faces, and they're sure to come back to your balcony if you treat them to something yummy. If you offend a magpie, they're gonna remember that too and bear some grudges. So keep an eye on your eye. Pardon the pun. Pelicans are symbols of love, and they say they're ready to sacrifice their own life to protect their offspring. Ah, now it's clear why they can swallow the entire prey without even chewing it or tearing it. You just don't want to go near their nest. Sure, you're not a tiny fish and pelican beaks are too small for a human being. But you don't want to be bitten now, do you? Okay, this one's going to frighten you only with its name. A shoebill stork is an impressively large bird, up to 5 feet, just below the average human height. No wonder they can fight a crocodile. Alright, a baby crocodile. But they need only their super powerful jaw to win in one hit. Still not afraid? Well, they make blood chilling noises, as if you were in some action blockbuster movie. Hmm. If you think these cowardly ostriches don't pose any danger, you got it wrong. Twice. First, they actually don't shove their heads in the sand. It's an optical illusion. And yeah, how are they even supposed to breathe in the sand? Second, these guys are kind of overprotective parents. So if you ever want to approach their young, these heavyweight beasts who can run as fast as a car within city limits are gonna come for you. Not scared yet? Well, you should be. Ostriches are the closest living relatives to T-Rex, together with chickens. What seems look quite harmless, except for their foul smell, but that's another story. But their babies have notorious wings. The chick's flappers have two distinct claws that are multi-purpose. First, they are a sort of protection against predators. And second, they help them climb trees in case the baby's out of the nest. Once they grow up, the claws disappear just like milk teeth. Size doesn't matter at times. If you were a hummingbird, you'd have to eat almost 300 pounds of food per day to maintain normal weight with that little bird's metabolism. But the lifespan would be way shorter too, only about 3 to 5 years. If you dye your hair, you probably have more in common with a bearded vulture than you might think. We're probably the only two species in the world who use dye on purpose. Vultures dye their feathers with red soil to show their dominance over other birds. People? Well, we just like changes. California condors may not be as large as an aircraft, but they're huge anyways. Their wingspan is almost 10 feet. These are potentially dangerous for people, but chances that you ever meet them are slim. There are only about 200 of them left in the US. Here you are, looking for something yummy in the fridge, but you just can't see what you really want. If you were a bastion thrust, you'd break wind at the fridge. Yeah, <laughs> Sounds gross, but that's apparently the way these birdies look for hiding worms. They give them a gas attack, so the worms get shocked and yippee! They are now an easy target for a bastion thrush. Hold your nose and bon appetit! Okay, enough of those funky stories. Let's look at the skies. You wouldn't expect a poisonous bird on this list, but alas, I present to you the hooded pitahui. Scientists found out they were poisonous when they kept experiencing numbness and a burning sensation after handling these birds. There are lots of toxins in their feathers, especially on the underside. The birds don't produce toxins themselves. They probably get them from the beetles they eat. Or how about the spur-winged goose? These guys are notorious for being toxic too. And the toxicity comes from munching on blister beetles. Blech. It's safe to touch them, but eating one can lead to irreversible consequences. Wink, wink. The toxin remains even after cooking. Another bird you don't want to eat is a common quail. Don't mix it up with a Japanese quail, which is usually kept as poultry. 
common quails can be really poisonous, leading to even such dreadful consequences as kidney failure. It all depends on the certain plants this bird eats. Good news, it's only poisonous during the migration period, but it's yummy and safe outside the migration. If you're not quite sure, it's better to avoid this one on your plate unless you want some muscle soreness. If you spot a cute, fluffy, snowy owl, you better close your eyes and run. They might look innocent, but in fact, they have razor-sharp talons which they know perfectly how to use. They point them at the most vulnerable parts, like head, eyes, you got it. Do not mess with a snowy owl. One more species you don't want to contact is the little shrike thrush. Say that a few times fast, shrike thrush. Just look at this tiny birdie and its innocent eyes, and don't let them fool you. Remember the way they look and never touch them. They're as poisonous as notorious Central and South American dart frogs. Blue-capped Ifrida may be tiny, but it has a toxic mechanism that makes this small birdie invincible. They eat only certain types of beetles that provide this bird with special toxins. Even if you touch it, you'll probably get numb as a result of intoxication. It's inedible since the toxins don't disappear even when it's cooked. Golden eagles are the power lifters in the bird's world. They can carry weights up to 4 pounds. They pick up tortoises and other prey easily. These mighty birds are strong enough to steal a toddler, but they actually never do that. Moreover, in Mongolia, people even use these eagles to hunt wolves. Canada geese have been living close to humans for years, but they're still wary of us getting near their homes, especially in the spring mating season. At this time, the geese can chase and bite people they consider a threat to their eggs, mates, or babies. If you want to avoid being attacked by these seriously angry birds, the best thing you can do is just slowly back away. Romantic seagulls in the sky don't seem to cause many problems. The worst thing they can do is leave you some unwanted droppings. Well, this impression is pretty misleading because these birds are very aggressive. Like all of their kind, they don't attack because they feel like doing so. So the rule is quite simple. Just don't touch those birds and stay away from their nests. Oh, and when the time machine is finally invented, be especially careful with the birds from the past. Velociraptors are long past existing, just like the rest of the dinosaurs. They had talons and feathers, so these guys were actual birds and not scaly lizards. By the way, these are the stiletto sharp talons you should be afraid of. These could cut anything. Beware if you go into the future, too. You never know what's waiting for you over there. Welcome to an uninhabited island. How did we end up here? Well, I don't know. But now, we have to survive here for a couple of days, and I'll teach you all I know. Gladly, wherever I go, I'm always prepared for a situation like this. So in this magical backpack, I've got everything we're gonna need for survival. The first thing is, of course, a knife, which will come in handy in many situations. Surrounded by the ocean, you don't have any drinking water available. Oops, I didn't put any water in the backpack. But don't panic. Your most reliable source of water here is the coconuts. So we need to fetch some of those. If you're lucky to get some green coconuts, you can cut them open with a knife. It's relatively easy. But the problem is that they grow high up on the tree. You're free to climb up there to get some but it's not gonna be easy. Luckily, when coconuts mature, they turn brown and fall off the tree. The water inside stays safe to drink for about nine months, so you can pick some up from the ground. The problem here is that they can be pretty hard to open. However, if you're lucky to have a screwdriver, it won't be a big deal. Also, a simple stone can crack a coconut for you. But don't forget to wrap it in a towel or even a t-shirt beforehand. Remember that you can't drink as many coconuts as you want. Don't drink more than 5 brown coconuts a day, unless you want to get an upset stomach. By the way, the same goes for green coconuts. After you drink a brown coconut, don't rush to throw it out. You can scrape off the white part and eat it. 
It's totally edible. I admit, I didn't bring any bowls, but this is once again where coconuts come in handy. It can be turned into one. After you cut it open, you have bowl-shaped pieces. Start by removing all the white stuff from the inside until it's just a shell. This is going to be your bowl, but we'll make it pretty. Scrape the hair off using the knife. Then you can rub it around with sand, making it smoother. The last thing to do is to polish it with the coconut's very own coconut meat. The oils in it will make your bowl shiny and pretty. Okay, the most important skill is to make fire, of course. I did put a couple of lighters and a matchbox in the bag to make it easier, but you just can't be a qualified survivor if you don't know how to start a fire without them. You need to find a curved piece of wood and tie a bowstring to it like this, so it looks like a bow. In case you don't have a nylon cord, a shoestring will work too. So whenever you go traveling, wear shoes with laces, I guess. Next, find a piece of dry hardwood. It will be your spindle. You will need to wrap the string of the bow around it so you can create friction. The spindle can be fixed to a board with a notch that can hold it. Also, you'll need to find another piece of wood that's usually called a hand block. It should have a dimple carved into it, which will make it easier for you to create friction. So here's how it goes. The board holds the spindle, and you twist the bowstring around it just like this. On top, you hold the spindle with a hand block. Then you start moving the bow, rubbing it around the spindle and creating friction. It will start heating up, and in the end, you'll get an ember. After you get an ember, you need to carefully move it to a bundle of tinder and blow on it, trying to start the fire. It's going to be tough to do it the first time, but after you get a hold of it, you can start the fire in less than five minutes. Now that we have the fire, we need food. The obvious choice is to go fishing. So in my magic backpack, I have a fishing kit. It's just a small box with some hooks and strings, but it's going to be a tremendous help. The rest is just practice and skills. If you manage to catch some, you need to cook it. And that's the easy part now that you have both fish and fire. Wrap your fish in coconut leaves, tie it up with bark, and put it on the coals of your fire. Wait for about 20 minutes, but before eating, make sure it's well cooked. Just pierce the fish at an angle with a fork or a toothpick and twist gently at the thickest point. If the fish is cooked, it will flake easily. Bon appétit! Everything changes when the sun goes down. You have to be prepared for the night. So, during the day, you have to make a shelter out of sticks and palm tree leaves. Pieces of bark can be used as strings, but it's also a good idea to walk along the shore and see what gets washed out. There can be a lot of trash there, and some of that can be useful. If you go to an island, you need to have devices that will help you not to get lost. I have something here. It's a multifunction water-resistant watch I got on Amazon. Apart from the time, there's also a compass, a thermometer, a scraper, a whistle, and even a fire starter. Yeah, you don't really need to spend two hours with the sticks, but I wanted to teach you. <laughs> so take the watch with you as you go into the jungle. We need material for the shelter. Sticks, bark, and palm tree leaves which are actually harder to pull off the tree than you may imagine. So dry ones on the ground work too. Make the roof of the shelter using palm tree leaves, but also put some on the ground for you to lie on. But be careful. Make sure that the leaves you're using are free of snakes, spiders, or scorpions. You don't want any of them in your bed. The other thing is that at night, insects and many other creatures come out and they will be very happy to join you in your shelter. So the fire and termite mounds around the shelter will help to keep at least some of them away. Others can still sneak in and climb under your clothes, walk on you, and bite you. So, time for the magic backpack. Here, I have a survival sleeping bag. Being just four inches long, it doesn't take up much space. 
but it's tear resistant, waterproof, and keeps your body heat inside. Plus, it has sealed seams, which will keep out water, wind, and any insects. You can find it on Amazon. Also, don't build the fire right in front of the entrance of the shelter. In this case, you might end up breathing smoke all night. And now you're all set. Just a couple of tips on how to survive. Your phone, which is probably the one thing you'll have with you, is pretty useless here. But not exactly. The screen of your no-signal cell can be used to reflect sun and moonlight to send SOS signals. Second, in conditions when you don't particularly have much water resources, try to keep your body cool. So just walk in the water once in a while so it doesn't get overheated and so that you don't get too dehydrated. And, of course, always have a first aid kit with you. It's the last survival thing I have in my backpack. Also, from Amazon. It's a water-resistant bag with a pair of scissors, band-aids, tweezers, bandages, and so on. Pretty useful stuff in the wild. Happy survival, even though I hope you'll never have to do it unprepared. A slice of cheese isn't something you'd expect to find on your parked car. As hilarious as it seems, it might indicate something quite dangerous. One woman detailed such a story online. At first, she thought she had been pranked by some neighborhood kid. She decided to call a friend and ask for help with cleaning the car. But once the two ladies started removing the melted cheese, they noticed something strange two parking spots down from them. They remembered seeing a white van arriving. In it, there was a bunch of men staring at them. Since she wasn't alone, the woman decided to finish cleaning the car, even though the ladies didn't feel comfortable being watched. It took them almost an hour to scrape off the cheese that had already been melted under the heat of the sun. She did wonder, though, if this wasn't a tactic to rob a person, because most people would be so focused on cleaning up the mess on their car that they would be too distracted to keep an eye on their belongings. Or worse, what if it was a kidnapping strategy, since you wouldn't be able to see suspicious people coming at you in due course? She went on to recommend, if you ever see a piece of cheese on your car, just leave it. Your safest bet is to scrub it off at home or to take your vehicle to the nearest car wash. They'll know the best way to remove it without ruining the paint. The slice of cheese may have easily been a coincidence, but some scams out there are even more imaginative. If you notice a piece of clothing on your windshield or wrapped between your wiper blades, don't hurry to take it away. Again, it can be strategically placed there to distract you while your car gets taken away. The best option is to drive away as quickly as possible and get to a safe location. It should be well lit and populated. Then you can safely remove the objects placed on your car. Some people have even found money under their wipers. It was probably placed there with the same intent in mind. Here's a method some people swear by when it comes to decreasing the odds of getting your car snatched away. Keep the tires turned toward the curb when parked. That's because when your car wheels are positioned like that, thieves are less likely to be able to maneuver the vehicle. This way, your car will require more time and energy to be moved, and it will less likely become the focus of theft. Another woman remembered finding a napkin under her car door handle at one point, but at that time, she didn't think much of it. She removed it and went on with her day. However, a couple of hours later, she ended up in a hospital, complaining about pain in her hand and shortness of breath. Doctors figured out she had been poisoned with an unknown substance. Unfortunately, scams are becoming more and more common these days, with online ones topping the list. You may be the subject of a phishing scam, for example, when you receive an email from someone who seems familiar. It might be your accountant, someone from work, or a retailer you often buy from. But if you look closely at the email address, you'll easily notice that something is off. It might just be one edited letter or a name spelled differently. These types of emails can ask various things from you. Anything from private information, such as addresses and passwords, to payment requests. Others offer coupons or gift cards. If you click on a certain website, it may actually hack your computer. This is probably the most common online scam these days. Authorities claim that over 114,700 people fell victim to it in 2019. Their losses were estimated at roughly $57.8 million. Then, there are fake shopping websites. To make sure you're always on the right one, check the URL carefully. 
If the website reads Amazon.com with a zero, you're obviously not in the right place, and you're probably about to get scammed. You can buy something from these websites, but the chances are you'll be receiving nothing, or the best case scenario, a fake item. Ever heard of form jacking? It happens when a retailer gets hacked, and once you've finished adding things to your cart during a shopping session, you're actually redirected to a fraudulent payment page. The scammer then has access to your payment information, like your name, address, and credit card details. To always be on the safe side, double-check the URL of the payment page before entering any sensitive information. Tech support scams are even more creative. With this one, you might even receive a phone call saying that your computer is infected with a dangerous virus, which may damage your device or destroy all the information stored on it. The scammer may then ask you to download an application that will give them access to your computer, even if they're located on the other side of the world. Then they'll download an actual virus on the computer to confirm their lie. It makes people think there's indeed something wrong with the computer. The next and final step, asking for a fee to fix it. If you suspect your device might be compromised, always reach out to a trusted tech support or retailer. These types of businesses will never contact you out of the blue. This scam tends to appeal to people's emotions, targeting mostly the older generation. That's why it's also dubbed the grandparent scam. The targeted senior will most likely receive a phone call from a distressed person, claiming they're a grandchild or a close relative. The fraudster will then proceed to ask for money for various things, like to get out of jail, to be able to leave a foreign country, or to cover a hospital bill. Grandparent scams are really on the rise these days. In 2017, the losses from such scams added up to $26 million, but in 2018, they almost doubled, reaching $41 million. If you find yourself in a similar situation, try not to act immediately. Ask the person for some information that could help you verify their identity. Also, it might be a good idea to double-check with another family member before sending money to a stranger. The Google Voice scam is as easy as it is efficient. For scammers, of course. Here's what you should look out for. You might have posted your phone number on some website for various reasons. Maybe you're looking to sell something or offering to perform a service. The fraudsters will pick up on this information and rapidly call you, asking to verify if you aren't a scammer yourself. Talk about reverse psychology. You'll be asked to pass on a Google verification code. In reality, a Google Voice account is being set up in your name. Fraudsters can go on with their scams and pretend to be you while doing it. Using the newly created account. Rule number one, never share verification codes with anyone. Online resumes aren't safe either, as they can offer personal information to scammers. They will try to contact you, pretending to be recruiters. Some might even take the time to conduct a job interview. Most of them pretend to offer high-paying positions, which you'll obviously be inclined to accept. But here's the catch. Before they can offer you the documents for employment, you'll be asked for money for some participation fee, or even for your future home office setup. To make sure you're always on the safe side, create a different email address, which you'll only use for job hunting. This way, you can keep your personal email unlisted and safe from any unwanted online scams. Always ask recruiters to confirm the information you've heard on the phone via email too. If it's a company you're familiar with, you can also reach out to their HR department to confirm that what you're asked to do is according to their policy. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay